Hey, True Believers England team here, and I'm very excited for this video series, and it will be a series because I want to do more than just the first issue of What If. I want to talk about basically all of it, at least uh, the first series, Volume 1. Amazing, loved it as a kid, picked it up uh, religiously. Seriously, I, I absolutely am f fanatical about it. The... TV show is on, so I figured, what the hell, let's do this along with it, because you know everybody and their brother, including me at some point, are doing their, hey, it's a weekly show, we're, we're, we're watching it and talking about it. So anyway, we're going to go through as many of these as you guys could possibly stand. Hopefully they're successful, because I hate spinning wheels <laughs> as far as all these are concerned. So let's go through the what if, and uh, I, I hope you guys enjoy. All right, starting off with the cover, we've got... Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, or in this case, the Fantastic Five, bursting out of the comic book pages of Amazing Spider-Man number one. And this is very addictive. It tells the story of what if it is going to be. And I think it's the perfect way to start off a series. It, it is, it's just, and it's an indicative of what you are going to get inside. Absolutely fantastic cover. Love it. Next up, we meet the Watcher, and he basically introduces himself again. Obviously, we saw him in the pages of Fantastic Four at this point, or at least those who are around for this. And he gives us the, the lowdown, who he is, what his job is. I like this over future incarnations of What If, where it was just like, what if Spider-Man? Well, what if Spider-Man what? You know, this this one actually tells you not only the, the title, What If Spider-Man Had Joined the Fantastic Four, but it explains the multiverse, and then it also, in my opinion, does the best thing possible and tells you the turning point, tells you the, the branch, where this reality branched off into another reality. Future incarnations didn't do that, and I thought they kind of lost the point. You lose the plot when you don't do that. And um, I'm just, I'm kind of happy, happy on this book. This is a great book. This, there's no way you're going to hear me slamming this book at all. So kick back and just basically enjoy me gushing over it for just a little bit. So after the Watcher basically does the whole, uh, this is multiverses and so forth, we finally get into the story where he's talking about how Peter Parker, about how Spider-Man got his powers and how the Fantastic Four got their powers and how these two are going to come together. We see Spider-Man as he sets out. He gets all dressed up, wants to go to the Baxter building and basically apply for a job with the Fantastic Four and he can't get in through the elevator so he decides to go across uh, to another building and then shoot a web and for some reason walk across the web instead of swinging and a, uh, a whole bunch of people say, look up and go, hey, yo, look! There's Spider-Man, and he's crossing to the Baxter building. What's up, gang? Of course, the Fantastic Four being no dummies, they, they detect somebody. Spider-Man jumps into the building, and he's immediately captured in a glass tube. But he breaks out, and basically a fight ensues with everybody. He actually does a good job of... He doesn't really beat the thing as far as strength, but he does use his agility to flip him into the Human Torch. Mr. Fantastic tries to get a hold of him. He webs up his arms. And then the Invisible Girl tries to stop him. No avail. Human Torch. Then finally, Mr. Fantastic puts up a wall and goes, Okay, maybe it's time you tell us why you're here. And he, that's when he says, I, I need a job. And the thing says, I knew it. That kook is rocks in his head. And Sue says, Afraid you made a mistake, Spider-Man. We're a nonprofit organization. And Mr. Fantastic says, We pay no salaries or bonuses. Any profit we make goes into scientific research. And the Human Torch says, You came to the wrong place, pal. This isn't General Motors. And this is where the story breaks off. As the Watcher explains for a moment, things go just as they did in your world. And then he says, and this is where it ends up, uh, Spider-Man starts to swing away as he did in the real comics. And she says, Spider-Man, wait, come back. And he returns, and Sue actually ends up convincing Reed that maybe they could use the extra hand. This upsets Thing and, and Johnny a little bit because 
Reed actually uses the term. We could use the raw power and things like, yo, well, you know, I'm the strongest one here, and Johnny not being a slouch either shows off, but Reed hoses them down like they've got a fire hose already just in case because of Johnny and says, uh, I didn't say he was better than you guys. We're just going to hire on some help. But the thing is, is the Fantastic Four, they're a public entity. They ever, Their identities are known, so... At the very least, Spider-Man has to reveal his identity to them. He wants to protect May, so he doesn't reveal it to everybody else, but at least the Fantastic Four need to trust him, so he does. And he uh, says, okay, he goes home, talks to May, and tells her that he's got a job that means the hours are going to be all kind of wonky, and she's like, at least he's not Spider-Man. So that evening, the Fantastic Four hold a press conference where they announce that Spider-Man is now a part of the Fantastic Four, or at least now as they're known, the Fantastic Five. And as you could think, that this sets off a lot of reporters, especially J. Jonah Jameson, who goes, oh yeah, well I know something about him. And everybody's like, look, it's J. Jonah Jameson, publisher of The Bugle. Namely, he's a cheap raisin crook. Come off it, Jameson. What proof do you have? Proof? I'll show you proof. These headlines right here in my own newspaper. He stands accused of sabotaging our recent space flight in order to make himself a hero by saving the life of my son, astronaut John Jameson. And Reed Richards says, correct. He stands accused but not convicted. A man is innocent until he's proven guilty or haven't you heard? And Spider-Man is no longer officially even accused of anything. I've personally vouched for him to NASA and all charges have been dropped. And Sue says, what do you say to that, Mr. Jameson? To which he jumps on stage and says, well, I, what I always say, that it's always pays, it always pays to be careful. Actually, I was just playing devil's advocate. Can't choose your heroes too easily, you know. But if NASA had forgiven and forgotten, never let it be said that J. Jonah Jameson isn't man enough to do the same. And Spider-Man's like, who asked you? Matter of fact, that's right why I'm really here to make sure Spidey here gets a fair shake. And uh, so he basically hams it up. And we find out this is one of the big turns right here where the chameleon was ready to commit a series of crimes and blame it on Spider-Man. But now that he's with the Fantastic Four, he can't do that anymore. So the chameleon goes off into obscurity. And next we see the Fantastic Four taking on the Vulture. <laughs> okay, so yes, this is the next Spider-Man villain that Spider-Man would have taken care of, and that's kind of cool, but it's like sad that the Fantastic... It's like just this is a beatdown. Vulture can't stand up to the Fantastic Four. It's just... It's almost like bullying right there. And then we get to see them take on the next Fantastic Four villain. It's the Red Ghost and his apes. They're going to go to the moon, but... Reed was working on this ship for four, so he convinces Sue to stay behind. And as you're going to see, this is a little bit of a theme. Once again, though, it does show that, yeah, they ha the Fantastic Five have a little bit of an easier time than just the Fantastic Four defeating the Red Ghost and his superpowered apes. But uh, there is always give and take. I may have called the bad guy the wrong name. So I know you comment, to, comment people are going to correct me, so go about it, gang. Uh, okay, so after they defeat them, the Fantastic Four flying back, and they see a crowd, and they're like, Woo, there's a public. Let's go say hi. But while they're doing that, Sue is in the Baxter building, and she, uh, she starts hearing things. Sue, this is the Submariner. Meet me. I kind of dig the fact that it's like, meet me, meet me, meet me. For Sue has long puzzled the fact that Though she does profess love for Reed Richards, she is strangely fascinated by the sea-dwelling Prince Namor. She goes out to meet Prince Namor, and now, sensing suddenly that the amphibian needs her, she goes to a deserted pier on New York's Lower East Side, and you see her, she's invisible. I'll remain invisible until I make certain this isn't a trick or a trap. Uh, no, it can't be a trap. It's him. I'd know him anywhere. Namor, I've come at... Why don't you speak? Why don't you say something? But the sea monarch barely responds, except to step wordly aside, to reveal a hovering, fluttering hypnofish behind him. Bum, bum, bum. Its single hypnotic eye focused upon her. She is under your spell. Now do as I have instructed. At Namor's command, the amazing creature forms a huge air bubble around the docile figure and into the sea with her. 
It is perhaps just as well that Sue Storm in her mesmeric state can no longer think for herself, since in any event the Submariner's actions in taking her to his undersea domain would remain a mystery to her. We do discover that it is in fact the Puppet Master who is controlling Namor to kidnap Sue Richards to cause, I guess, some sort of riff and fight between the Fantastic Four and Prince Namor. The uh, other... I keep saying Fantastic Four, but at this point, it's Fantastic Four. The other guys, they show up at the house and uh, realize she's not home anywhere. Johnny sees Namor and yells, It's the Submariner! He's mine! And he flies towards him, but ends up going right through him. Spider-Man tries to shoot his web uh, and uh, ends up hitting Ben Grimm, who drops a 10-ton, basically, metal plate onto his foot. Reed starts to attack, but then goes, who am I kidding? You're, you're just an, a projection of yourself. And St Submariner tells them that, yes, he has Sue. And they go searching the Baxter building, and they find out that, yeah, he's telling the truth. Sue is gone. So they make their way to Atlantis, and we do see that the Puppet Master and his own little... Everybody's got a submarine in the, uh, in the Marvel Universe in the 60s. But the Puppet Master is following along, I guess, so he could keep control somehow. But there you go. That's what's going on so far, gang. And as the uh, Fantastic Four are going towards Atlantis, basically Submariner has a big old clam capture the Fantastic Four sub. So they all wake up, or they all get released, I should say, and Submariner's like, Aha! Look, I've got Sue Richards, and she's in this glass dome, and soon a squid's going to break it. And Reed's like, Hold on, gang. Something's going on here. Submariner's in love with her. There's no way that he would put her in this kind of danger. But Ben Grimm and Johnny, they're not listening. They're like, screw that. Let's kick his ass. So they start running towards him. Human Torch gets there first. He grabs onto a heat absorbing. It's a heat absorbing sea plant, and he just kind of rubs it all over Johnny Storm, and he can't flame on for a while. Ben Grimm tries to grab onto Namor, but he slips through his arms. He's as slippery as an eel, Ben says. And the, the Submariner throws some sea mold at him, which actually grows exponentially and gets harder and harder. Spider-Man's able to get a couple of knocks in before Submariner bats him away. Then Reed makes his move, and Namor actually says that, you know, you've been one of the more strangely powerful members of this group. And then they say something bullcrappish, and that's that Reed is stretched to his limits. In the first issue, or at least the first appearance of Doctor Doom, he stretches to the point where he can fit through the air holes in concrete. This is not the most he can stretch, and I hate it when the comics do that to Reed Richards. But while, but while the team is busy with Namor, the Thing actually makes it into the tank where he beats the crap out of the octopus and then saves Sue Storm. So he basically orders Namor to change stuff up. At first he just wanted the Fantastic Four defeated. Now he's saying kill him. But Namor actually does like Sue Richards, so he kind of fights the control of the Puppet Master and breaks free. Causes the Puppet Master to run, and he ends up getting attacked by the same giant octopus that had Sue Richards in the little glass dome. And with all that aside... We see Namor and Reed Richards basically square up against each other again. Namor says, Now Richards, we will continue our battle. And we hear Richards say, At your service, Namor, we'll settle our rivalry over Sue for good. And Sue says, Whoa, Namor, Reed, you can't settle it that way. The only one who could decide this is me. And I guess I love you both in different ways, though my loyalties have always been to Reed, but... Reed's shown me that he doesn't need me, and neither does the FF. So I choose Namor. And so Namor says in order to live down there, she has to revert to being a water breather, which is stupid because they are literally in a, uh, a an atmosphere with oxygen that's obviously sustainable. But she does it. She goes through his little magical doohickey, and she comes out the other end a water breather. So Namor shatters the oxygen dome. It's like just putting up a middle finger to see, because she's given up everything at this point, including oxygen. And we see that Reed is uh, heartbroken, but trying to move on from his decisions. Spider-Man, of course, says, I can't help but think if I didn't join the team, this wouldn't have happened. 
and uh, Watcher says, see, that's what the multi-dimensions are. I'm the Watcher. Stay tuned next week when it is What If the Hulk Had Always Had Bruce Banner's Brain. Actually, it was two months. Here, it's going to be tomorrow. So keep an eye out. I hope you enjoyed this one. I like this issue, man. I dig it. I think it's pretty damn good. Uh, when I was a kid, of course, that really affected me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Sue Storm's not going uh, with, with her family. That's so sad. Uh, and it did kind of amuse me at how many of these have sad endings. So there you go. But I thought the issue was incredible. What would you think? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to click like, share, and subscribe. Mainly sharing, 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 and watch one of the videos that are going to be popping up around here, which ultimately they're just going to be more what if stories after a while, but I don't know what's going up right now. So please click on that. And if you'd like to help out the channel, just go to the link for Ko-Fi or to Patreon in the description below. Drop a dollar in the till helps keep the lights on, helps keep making videos for you. Like, thank everybody who's already done that. And to everyone, all of the true believers, thank you very, very much for watching.